So the idea is, as many of you know, we're doing a book study on Richard's book, uh, Embracing the Void, starting next week. And I've been talking a lot about his work over the last couple of months. So this is really an opportunity for us to have a conversation. Um, I want to do a very brief introduction uh, to you, Richard, and then we'll kick off. I am terrible at introductions, by the way. It's my worst thing. Anytime I have to introduce somebody, my mind, I've tried to do serious. I've tried to do funny. And I think it's because I take no interest in historical details. <laughs> um, like when I like somebody, I read their book, and go, oh, I really like the book. And then when I have to come to introduce them, I'm like, I don't know what to say, bar I've read the book, but I will say two things. Um, one is, uh, both books that you've released this year, uh, Blown Away and Embracing the Void, um, I felt that, I suppose, what I like most about a book is in one sense, I feel something alien, something I can learn, something that is other, something that can kind of expand my purview. Uh, but in another way, I feel like I've come home. There's something in it that I go, oh, I resonate with this. This is, this is where I feel comfortable. This is helping to... Um, but make clear where I where I already fit, uh, and also the warmth. Uh, there's a warmth to the writing which is so important to me. And the other thing I do want to embarrass you, but the other thing is you have been such a kind and generous person. You and Rebecca, both uh, your wife, they uh, came over to Belfast uh, to the Wake Festival uh, and hung out with people. And it was this beautiful experience. And I'm always glad when someone who's writing I love is someone who I feel is also a very kind and generous person. So that's my introduction to uh, Richard Boothby. Um, uh, now, this week, the plan is to look at some theoretical ideas, uh, kind of like uh, create the context. And then next week, we'll look at those ideas specifically in terms of religion. If you're watching live, please use the live chat box to ask questions. Um, I'm going to be looking at that in a little while. Uh, but what I'll do is I'm, I'm going to kick off uh, with something that happened last night. Uh, the YouTube algorithm, when I was bored, somehow showed me some short video about the Mona Lisa. And what was interesting about this is that an art historian was saying, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this painting uh, that makes it, I mean, basically the most famous painting in the world. I think it's the most visited painting in the world. It's probably the most photographed painting in the world. And the historian was attempting to help us understand why that might be. And he talked about how this figure has a type of enigmatic dimension. Something about the look uh, is very composed, but there's something going on. And there's a question. There's a question mark about what is this person's desire, what's going on within her. And what I want to do in this conversation, we're going to unpack this notion that we're oriented towards the unknown. We're oriented towards the desire of the other. Um, and there's something about the Mona Lisa that has that. But, but the next thing I thought was, well, that's not really the case because for most of us, it's the enigmatic desire of the art lover. So there's an art lover who looks at the Mona Lisa and goes, what is she thinking? What's going on? But probably most people go there because of the enigmatic desire of the art lover. It's like, why does someone else like this painting? What is going on that makes this so desirous? So in this kind of like, th there's almost like three people here. There's Mona Lisa, who's got this enigmatic desire. And then I am drawn by why do so many people go to see this painting? And so I want to go and see it myself. So... Does that connect in any way to this notion of what Freud calls dusting? Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, um, the your example brought up, I guess, to you by seeing it last night uh, somewhere, couldn't be more apt in a way. Um, this book, uh, Embracing the Void, is an attempt to try to give a, a general theory of the religious from a Lacanian point of view, something, by the way, it's nice to say this right up front, that Lacan himself refused to do. He even talks 
at, a, at more than one point about how he doesn't really advise attempting this, that he thinks a general theory of religion is probably going to be a mess. But uh, I attempted it <laughs> with, with what degree of success remains to be seen. But, but it does seem to me that Lacan is very significantly different in his whole approach and whole um, relation to the religious than was Freud, where Freud was unrelentingly critical. Lacan's thousands of little comments about religious figures, religious problematics, religious traditions, religious rituals, and so on and so forth, indicate to me that, that he has a kind of interest that Freud didn't have, a kind of counterbalance to the critical moment. And it's centered, I want to argue in this book, on this very odd notion of what in German is called das Ding, the thing, the unknown thing in the other. Interestingly, it's Freud who comes up with this little theory in an unpublished piece, a letter, part of the what's now called the project for a scientific psychology, which was never published. And Freud actually tried to get the, the manuscript uh, of it uh, from the friend he sent it to and, and destroy it. He destroyed his own copy. But in this essay, he discusses this, this thing, das Ding. And Mona Lisa is a perfect illustration of it, not least because Lacan thinks art is definable sublimation or that marvelous and unique feeling of wonder at and at the splendor of the art object, its hold on us. He says sublimation occurs when the ordinary object is raised, he says, to the dignity of dust ding. So here we have, I think you're right, Peter, this is the probably the most famous art object in the world. And so we ask the question, you're already asking it, what does it mean that is the desire of the art lover? Or, or the, is there even a difference between the reaction of anybody who just looks at this face as opposed to the art lovers or even what we've heard about it from other people? Oh, wow, you've got to see Mona Lisa. If you're in Paris, you have to see Mona Lisa. That's the number one thing. And I think both have to do with dusting in this way. First the, first, the art lover thing. When we hear that people talk about Mona Lisa, oh, that's the greatest painting in the world. Everybody's in awe of it. What we're really getting or what we're tuning into is a certain kind of answer to what other people desire, a certain kind of answer to the question, what are they interested in? What do they find important? That's already on the turf of dust ding, where dust ding means what we don't know for sure, and maybe don't know at all about our fellow human being. So this so, is, oh yeah, go ahead. So to agree, this is the world's greatest art object is already to kind of be, at some level, we're curious and we're concerned to know what other people think. And we're also relieved when we can agree okay, this is the greatest painting, okay, we're all on board for that. Yeah. There we've experienced something of the unknown in the other, and at the same time, notice, we've sort of consoled ourselves, it's not something terrible, it's just this painting, which is actually kind of fun to look at. Mm. So, like, for the art lover, if I go to see the Mona Lisa, is there a sense in which um, it's a, a good metaphor for the earliest question that I the infant has with their mother when they look at the face of the mother and they ask what does she want what does she want from me that there's so, there's something about you know looking at that piece of art and going like what what is going on in Mona Lisa's eyes what does she exactly. want is there some sort of connection there exactly this is precisely what Freud says in this quite brief little fragment in the 1895 text he says the infant's experience of the mother, the most important person in the infant's life, divides into two parts. One part the infant recognizes as a kind of reflection of its own body, exactly, interestingly enough, what Lacan calls the imaginary. 
I see somebody over there who has a head and hair and arms and they're looking at me with their eyes. I'm looking back. This is reassuring, says Freud. This grounds us and makes us feel like, okay, I know what's happening here. But then there's something else, something unknown. And as such, something anxiety producing. Kind of like, oh, wait a minute. I see her over there, but what is she really feeling? Or as you're putting it, what am I to her? How does she regard me? Does she love me? Does she merely put up with me? Might she leave altogether because she's not interested in me anymore? I don't actually know this about the other. And this is what Freud calls das Ding, this dimension of unknown that we encounter in every single human being. And yeah, that Bona Lisa is an exquisite example of this because even if you're not an art critic and you're just looking at this face who's looking interestingly directly at you, at first, it's very charming, it's very pleasant. You look at it, you go, oh, oh that's kind of cool. I, I, I like looking at her. Her gaze is kind of warm and, and it, 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 it speaks to me in some way I don't understand. But fairly quickly, it's at least quite possible if you're kind of alert and a little open to it, to begin to say, what is she looking at? And why? What is that look? that's kind of magnetic. And then you're on the edge of something like the experience of dusting in the image of Mona Lisa herself. She suddenly becomes, as you say, an enigma. Yeah, because um, there's, there's such a composure and yet a little kind of smirk almost like, it's almost like Da Vinci has got the, to write to this edge of- Exactly, yeah. precisely. This would be a way in Lacanian terms of, des of describing or appreciating the genius of, 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 of Leonardo, that he, exactly as you say, he puts the image precisely on this extremely subtle edge between the reassurance and pleasure of the image of the other and this dimension of enigma, which can actually become uncanny and threatening at some point. Because yeah, that absolute hint of a smile, what is that? What's she smiling at and why? With what feeling and so on? And what does that bode for me? That's exactly right. And how, how does this then connect with anxiety? I mean, is this, is this the, is this experience of the infant with that question and that unknowing, is that, is that connected directly with the Lacanian notion of, of anxiety? Yeah, and it's very interesting because um, this is not, maybe we should put this up front. This is an important point in, in Lacan's work that he devotes one half of his seventh seminar very enthusiastically to this notion of dusting. It's a very, very rich, text. And it's also really announced as, hey, this is it. This is the core of what I'm really interested in. Then after that, I think that was the 1959-60 um, seminar, if I'm remembering right, but the seventh seminar called the Ethics of Psychoanalysis. After that, he almost completely leaves it behind. And you kind of wonder, what happened to this? You announced it with such importance and emphasis. And it was so interesting and you, you kind of announce it as like it's the key to the whole theory. Then he seems to abandon it, uh, even in the second half of the seventh seminar where he talks about Antigone. He does, however, return to it a few really crucial times. We could talk otherwise what, why he seems to drop it, but he does return to it. And one is place is he says in the anxiety, three years later on anxiety, he says anxiety does have an object after all. Freud said anxiety is fear without an object. And Lacan says, well, maybe anxiety is not without an object. It's the most profound, most primordial object, das Ding. Das Ding is what makes us anxious. The, the actual experience of anxiety is therefore essentially this privileged threatening experience of what we don't know about the other and so 
early on the infant has to in a sense defend themselves in some way against this enigmatic dimension of the other exactly exactly yeah. in some way in some way and, and often we don't we'll talk about this more as we get into this i think but often we don't even know we're defending ourselves against it we merely distract ourselves uh but here's a lovely metaphor for it actually i'm looking at at my own door over there this is the door of my study you see the the, the handle in the in the background there uh this is probably it might even be the most famous cinematic uh frame the camera zooms and focuses in on the doorknob and it's motionless for a second then suddenly the doorknob begins to turn by itself and what do we know? We know someone is on the other side of the door. And of course, this is a trope that's used more than anywhere else in horror movies, because we're given to understand that the unknown on the other side of the door is probably horrible. This is a perfect image of dusting. Here we're given just enough evidence of another person another being like us on the other side of the door but we're deprived of any knowledge about what they're really after that's dusting and of course it's a favorite for horror movies because the cinematic doorknob turning without yet revealing what exactly or who exactly and for what reason is behind it is a kind of quintessential image of anxiety an anxiety stimulator. Oh yeah. So before then, maybe we jump into the defense against it. Then answer this. Then what? It, what does the other desire? Have they got yes, some substantive you, desire? <laughs> yeah. The way to take this, the doorknob thing, is to say, in a certain sense, every human being we meet is at least potentially that doorknob turning right in front of us and we can see it's turning but we don't know why or we see somebody and we feel their vitality we feel the force of their desire but we don't know what the desire is actually for and what i may or may not play as a role in relation to that desire so it's that this kind of consideration that leads lacan to say does ding is always potentially anxiety producing and it's there every time we meet a fellow human being at least potentially now the question actually that immediately pops up is why isn't it always terrifying why aren't we terrified of each other every minute how can you meet anybody mm -hmm. how can you go to the store and buy something and exchange money with the clerk without becoming terrified this is a, a really interesting question to which now we can give a really interesting answer. Right. Well, ordinary, ordinary intercourse with people is designed by us to keep us calm, not uncomfortably exposed to the question of the unknown and the other. Mm -hmm. That's a um, the, for me the analogy of. Uh, the covenant in uh in jewish religion is that people think covenants and contracts connect you to somebody but in a way a contract is designed to protect you from the other's desire because you know the other's desire could change at any point so having a contract in place saying you can have your kids on this day and not this day or a business contract it weirdly is not it kind of joins you but it also protects you from the the changing oceanic enigmatic desire of the other exactly so and, and and if you're extending that point uh the our word for law the greek word nomos originally meant something like a wall a wall for instance that divides my neighbor's pasture from mine notice it's one important thing is to keep your animals in but the other important thing is to to make a marker to say what's mine and what's not mine and so yes we have all kinds of written and unwritten laws codes 
that define for us who's who and what powers one person has over another, the object of which is to allay this anxiety of other people, to, to tame other people and make them possible for me to live with without being in dread. Yeah, there is something I've noticed, uh, you know, whenever people talk about dating apps, um, a lot of my female friends often say when I hope the guy's not a weirdo. And a lot of my male friends say, I hope she's not crazy. And so weirdo and crazy are interesting because I think of like, but if there was no weirdoness and no craziness there, you wouldn't really have any, the person would be so uninteresting, but if they're too much of a weirdo or too crazy, it's kind of off-putting. So actually what you need is the right amount of crazy or the right amount of weirdo. Is that the kind of, the, the kind <laughs> that of. That is exactly correct. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And, and this is very, very much on Lacan's mind, what he wants to say. And, and here he's, he's, He's ex he's exact uh, he's oops, how I put this he's intensifying um, and focusing what we can find in Freud the whole problematic of ambivalence we're both attracted and repelled we're both in desire and in fear we've got a fundamentally mixed emotion about the fellow human being um, and yes this is what we want most is to be in the presence of something that's a little anxiety producing, mm. hopefully not too much. We want a kind of sample almost, you might say, of the right amount of strangeness and threat that will excite us. Yeah. But we don't want too much, it then becomes traumatic. So in a way, language at its best is a, it's, it's a defense against, but also a semi-permeable memory and or a, a way for us to simultaneously protect ourselves and also gain some can uh touch in some way this dimension of the other yeah exactly exactly right so yeah, yeah we we want we in a certain sense we want to have it both ways and and to 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 skip ahead a little bit or a lot <laughs> yeah. if i'm right that from a Lacanian point of view, there's a very, very suggestive picture that we can draw of the religious impulse. If the religious impulse is, is a kind of longing to contact this unknown dimension, which we originally experience in the human other, but we can pose this question about the unknown, about anything, about the universe itself, about life itself, and also, also, by the way, very importantly, about our self, what is unknown in me. Um, that is something that attracts me, but also continually re-excites, or at least has the potential of continually re-exciting my anxiety. So and we're always in this kind of uncomfortable um, mix. Yeah, and there's there's a sense in which, like, um, there's otherness of what I don't currently understand, like, and is but I could potentially understand and I could learn, and then there's this idea of an otherness that can never be conquered, that can never be made into the I suppose the philosophical same can never be colonized, and it feels like you know sometimes like if religion becomes superstition if the otherness is something that you feel you can control, manipulate through sacrifices or prayers or something like that. But then you're talking about, then there's this level of, there's there's an otherness to the other that's not just not because you don't know them well enough. Like if I get to know you well enough, I will, have, I will eventually get to know what you desire. I'll eventually open the door. The door will be opened. I'll see what you want. I'll understand you. But you're, and what Lacan's saying is, no, there's a dimension of the other that can never be rendered understandable. Yes. Yeah. And yes, that's that, fantastic. That dimension in the other is, um, in some very profound way, correlative, and is a, a kind of provides a kind of clue, a kind of point of departure, a kind of stimulus for what remains unknown to me about myself. 
-hmm. So what we're dealing with, of course, in this in this in this way, dusting becomes almost another name for the the core of the unconscious itself. In fact, Lacan calls it in the seventh seminar a kind of center of gravity for all of the unconscious representations. The whole sort of contents of our unconscious is basically kind of animated by this question mark that I encounter in the other, but which I also have uh, asleep often in myself. So I'm going to jump ahead now, but I'll just for briefly, but I, one of the things I love about in the second half of the book is in a way you, you give like three kind of symptoms of religion. And the way I understood the symptoms of religion are you have kind of when religion is a way of tarrying with this unknown and potentially how human beings have attempted to orient themselves with it. And this, one of the symptoms is superstition, trying to control it through maybe sacrifices, and, you know, prayer. The other is laws to maybe try to protect oneself with the law. And the third is beliefs to attempt to protect yourself from this with beliefs. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see those three things in religion. So religion both tarries with this unknown, but also has produces sometimes these very powerful and potentially um, uh, violent um, symptomatic responses to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and exactly. Symptom is precisely the right word for it. And Freud defines symptom very, very clearly as a, a mixed, an object that gives us a mixed experience or that is intrinsically um you know bipolar in some way so in a in, in a symptomatic act i both approach desire but also or i allow the approach of desire but i also protect myself against it i also repress it so i can i mean here's a, a trivial but interesting example if i'm biting my nails out of a symptomatic anxiety i'm seeing the boss in a minute and i'm sitting outside his office and i'm nervous about my upcoming interview and i'm biting my nails in one sense i am expressing and a kind of an aggressive attacking impulse i'd like to this anxiety in the face of this terrible interview with this very powerful man i'm I, i'd like to go in there and just bite his nose off frankly he's making me so nervous but i don't i chew and gnaw on my own claws as it were so i'm in one sense defending myself against the outbreak of of, of what mother otherwise might be my own violence at the same time, however, I am exercising that violence. I'm chewing on my fingernails, I'm biting, I'm doing something aggressive, even if it's aimed at myself in this case. So the symptom is always, Freud says, a kind of mix of expressing a wish or a desire and repressing it. And yes, you're absolutely right. A lot of the book that I wrote is elaborating the symptomatic character of religion. In fact, I basically say from a Lacanian point of view, it's arguable that religion is the primary symptom of the human being. Why? Because religion opens us to the unknown and that's what's thrilling about it. In this sense, the fundamental religious impulse or the fundamental religious experience is something like awe. Mm -hmm. And we need that awe to be re-excited in us, to stay interested in religion. The temple and the sacrifices of the ancient world were occasions for awe. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have something counterbalancing this exposure to awe, then we can actually overdose and get a kind of terror. So the symptomatic flip side of the opening on awe is avoiding the awful, <laughs> the, the the terrifying. And there's where we need the laws and the rituals and the codexes and so on and so forth that kind of locate our relationship to ourselves and to others and to the universe and reassures us. It says, there, 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 yes, this is awful, but 
you can stand it. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's two, the thing, and we'll get into this next week more, but there is, um, you know, the traditional religious way of thinking about otherness and the unknown is that it's a pure excess that overwhelms our understanding something that cannot be put into words or experience and i suppose in some respects people think of trauma as that like a traumatizing event an infant experiences something that they cannot conceptualize they cannot symbolize um it's a too muchness uh, but also and the interesting thing about this lacanian approach is so there's the um the inability to express this excess but there's also this privation this um uh, this otherness that is not an excess, but is this profound void. Um, and, you know, I think that's a less uh, explored, I think, within kind of institutionally religious world. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in, in, in your work is because, say, we've got the mystical notion of the overabundance, the excess, um, the saturated phenomenon. Uh, but in many ways, there's something even more for the infant before we even get into religion, but for the infant, there are experiences that cannot be symbolized, but there is also this presence of an absence that is, uh, that is pure privation. Yeah, I, I, I would say that I would want to emphasize that, that, that there's a, there's a kind of privation that opens up a space of possibility. Um, I, I write about the temple, the space of the temple, the space of the sanctuary, this, the space of, 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 that's opened to perform sacrifices, the emptiness. You, 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 I, I must say, I, I, I have a love of wandering into churches whenever I'm in a foreign city uh, just to sort of sample them and I prefer them to be as empty as possible the, the best thing would be I'd be alone in them but the, I love those those yawning dark spaces of the interior of great cathedrals and so on and you could ask as Heidegger asked what is that what, what's the what what excites us about that that yawning space which otherwise might be yes anxiety producing um, and I think the answer from the point of view of of, of Lacanian theory and the, and the way I've drawn upon it in this book is to say this yawning emptiness can be anxiety producing, but it's also holds out a kind of promise of encounter with something we don't expect, we don't know how to name, um, which interests us, of course, at the deepest level, because not only is the other inhabited by such an unknown, but I am myself, yes. unknown to myself. And this is, yeah, I want to jump in that because that's the key is it's not just that I don't know what the other wants. I don't know what my mother wants. I don't know her desire. But even more unnerving is the realization that she doesn't either, that there's yes. no substantive desire in the other. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. She doesn't either. And neither do I, mm -hmm. uh, that, that this is sort of the most profound and, and, and bottomless kind of um, abyssal character of the human being is that we ourselves are kind of the ultimate um, enigma, the enigma to ourselves. One of the interesting parts of this, I think, is that um, uh, I mentioned Heidegger a minute ago. Um, Heidegger's theory of anxiety is, is very interestingly different from Lacan's. Heidegger thinks that I am myself the source of anxiety because I don't know what I am capable of. I'm a free being. As Sartre said, I'm a free being. I'm so radically free. I'm making a little stick figure here with my fingers on the edge of the frame. I can be terrified by vertigo standing on the edge of a cliff, not because I might fall off. No, what's terrifying? What's most deeply anxiety producing is I realize I can jump off. Stopping yeah. me from jumping. Yeah. Yeah. It's myself that anxiety that 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 grounds anxiety. Well, this was the Heideggerian view that Sartre takes it over. 
But the Lacanian view is, I think, much is a one step more complicated and I think much more interesting. I first encountered this dizzying possibility, what I, in Sartre's view, present to myself as the possibility that, oh my God, I might jump. What's keeping me from jumping? Nothing. I, I first experienced this in the other, and that makes all the difference. I am always not only an enigma, but I am an enigma outside myself, resonating with the world. The world itself, you might say, faces me with my own question to myself. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So we coming back to the Mona Lisa then is that, you know, it's it's structured around three people asking what is the other's desire? And there's no sub, sub, substance like the desire is. So there's the enigmatic desire, the Mona Lisa of the art lover and of me, the viewer of the art lover. There's there's this. So, I mean, and we try to fill in uh, that abyss with an answer. Is this connect with fantasy then or? Like the child has to try to find an answer to this enigmatic desire. Exactly. I mean, I think the best, uh, it, certainly in the terms that we've been using in the last half hour, fantasy, as it's sort of reclaimed by Lacan, it's absolutely central for Freud as well. But as, it, as Lacan sort of reclaims the theory of fantasy, fantasy is our effort to, to give more shape to that emptiness of the unknown um, in the other or in ourselves. And by the way, typically fantasy offers a kind of frame within which I can have a relationship to another. Uh, so it's kind of like neatly offers us not only a kind of filling out of the emptiness with particular images or particular acts, but often it, it, it coordinates with someone else. So I, I kind of overcome both the, the pure void, but also the void between me and the other. Do you, have you um, worked much with René Girard's notions of desire? And do you, how much do you think that idea of mimetic desire kind of like fits with or it runs in tension with Lacan? Because I, I mean, I, I've always found Gerard fascinating and his work on desire fascinating. I know, I agree with you. And I, I went through a period where I was quite um, interested in, in really following Gerard's arguments and stuff. I basically feel like he ha does have a lot to offer. I mean, I really recommend his work. Um, but I think he, he does tend to miss this crucial point um, that Gerard, when he talks about what you just referred to as mimetic desire, imita imitating desire. But I think basically what he's what he's getting onto, and this is certainly not nothing, he's getting onto the fact that I inevitably am drawn toward what I understand other people to, de to desire. So going back to the Mona Lisa, when I see everyone is in line to see this painting, I go, I better get in line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got to see what everybody else is talking about. You know, it's contagious. Um, and of course, this is what advertisers routinely try to exploit in us. I mean, this is not nothing. We're very deeply attracted to what we imagine other people are attracted to. Uh, what, what Girard, and so Girard's really good on that. What he misses, it seems to me, and by the way, he as you know, he didn't have a lot of time for Lacan. He thought Lacan was basically kind of a charlatan. Um, but I think what Lacan has that's really rich here and opens up, especially when we're talking about religion, something really valuable, because it's a, it's a dimension of, of, of unlimit. It's a dimension of infinitude. What, what, what Girard misses is, I don't just want to have the lollipop that that guy has. I want something I've never seen anybody have. And I can't even imagine it myself. That's what I want. I'll have one of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, in other words, the idea here, uh, by inserting das Ding, as Lacan takes it over from Freud, kind of like picking up Freud's, you know, the paper that he left in the, in the trash can of his own work, kind of, what he gains is a kind of stimulus toward 
the undefined, even the unrepresentable mm -hmm. in the human being. We are in our absolute core longing for that experience of awe where yeah. we're drawn up into something we do not understand. That's not like something you get to later. It's something, it's like our first impulse at our mother's breast when we begin to realize that she's a person with her own desires and we can't figure out where do those desires include me and where do they go on to stuff, stuff I've never seen and dreamt of before. But yeah. I become kind of obsessed with wanting to please her because I know somewhere in her there's a kind of desire that I sense, but I can't define. I'm haunted by it. The yeah. word haunted is great here, I think. Um, I don't, I, I defy anybody actually, now that I'm, I've become so kind of drunk on this whole perspective, I don't think you can really define the word haunt. Why, what does it mean to be haunted without something like the dimension of dusting that we don't really quite even know what we're afraid of when we're haunted. Yeah. It's almost like, like oh, I think that the infant, there's the presence and absence of the mother, almost like the Fort Dagium, and there's a presence and absence, and then the infant encounters an even deeper presence and absence, which exactly. is the presence of an absence. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly. I, I couldn't have said it better. Freud's, Freud was fascinated by that presence and absence, the Fort and the Da, the going away and the coming back. And the really wonderful Lacanian insight takes it that same dynamic to a deeper, really now ontological, metaphysical level. You know, we're, what we're after, what we sense and what we're haunted by cannot be defined. So it's almost like, you know, at, the, at an animal level, you can have pre presence and absence, but the moment when you can encounter this present absence of the other's desire and I guess I mean, we have maybe we haven't even used the word desire much maybe we have but desire is almost literally the name for the presence of an absence you, like when you you the de desire is kind of a not having so to desire yeah. the other's desire is yeah is a type of wanting a non-object something exactly yeah exactly and and I must say one of the things that um I personally really uh, love about this book. I mean, if I can detach myself as the writer of the book and simply say, you know, I, I find the book really satisfying, even with its limits and flaws, <laughs> even all the stuff I had to cut out of it to please the publisher. I want to see that. I hate to hear, but like Tom McGowan said that about his Hegel book, said about all the stuff he had to cut out. And I'm like, <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't remember who it was. Uh, Litton straight somebody says you know good writing is is being willing to murder your children you know um i i had to murder a lot of my children um but one of the things i really love about this book and i find it a rare thing actually um is it's a book that is critical of religion very hmm. pretty severe at points but it also says don't think you can have a human being don't think you can have humanity without something like religion, because it, religion corresponds perhaps more directly and more evocatively, more convincingly to our relationship with, with open awe than anything. It's our best attempt, you might say. Yeah. Failing something else, religion brings us closer to this absolutely essential human capacity the capacity for being haunted by what we cannot understand well, that's it that this is why i weirdly you know i find myself in the world of theology is that because for me the danger in the world is the engaging with everything is the same of 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 protecting oneself uh from a tarrying with this dimension of otherness, capital O otherness, otherness in, and this is what I love about the, the, the otherness in the other, but also, uh, and why I find Shizek so interesting is that that potentially everything is riven with this uh, with this contradiction, you know, like mathematics, biology, you know, uh, uh, physics, actual reality itself potentially has a type of non-at-oneness and that this- yeah. 
Yeah, and yeah, and that, and if if religion at its best is a, a, an attempt to not just theorize that, but to have a, a liturgy that helps us tarry with that, then then theology remains an essential uh, uh, dimension of culture. Yes, as, 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 as some of your listeners will recognize that when you just use the word tarrying, it's both a reference to Zizek, but it's a reference to Hegel. And, and Zizek, it's not an accident that he's, the two poles of his thought are so profoundly Lacan on the one hand and Hegel on the other. And I think Hegel is, is the great thinker of this relationship to the, of the human being to to what cannot be understood. Um, tarrying, the rest of the phrase in Hegel, of course, is tarrying with the negative. Mm -hmm. ta 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 tarrying, hovering around the profound emptiness, the, what you cannot define. Um, yeah, and I, I find this, uh, I find the, <laughs> It was it was especially painful, by the way, because a lot most of what I had to cut was stuff on Hegel. <laughs> oh no, uh, cut all that out of there. Um, it went to it was it made the book too long. But well, will um, it come out in other forms? Yeah, I just have to it. decide how to give it another form. Yeah, I have the various texts still. I've got to sort of recobble them into something. But um, but I do feel like one of the things that I would say it's changed my own life. I mean, I. Working on this book, I, when I first started it, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, um, I was, I wouldn't have said I was a hard-nosed atheist, but I was, I was not in a sympathetic period with religion. I think I was kind of very sensitive to aspects of religious life that I wanted to basically criticize um, and didn't want any part of. And this book really rescued me from that. I still have those critiques, but I have a, I have to say, a, a newfound kind of re reverence is not a bad word for this way of seeing the, reopening the core of the religious impulse, which as I now understand it, is this tarrying with the, with the awe, ta tarrying with what we don't know. Um, not trivializing it just as simply the unknown, but as this very evocative and very um, moving and inspiring, uh, as well as deeply challenging sense of what is beyond our understanding. Yeah, so before, you know, before I read your book, because what, what, one of the things, and next we will talk about this, but the, obviously you do in the book is how there is a way in which, especially in the gospels, you have this notion that if you want to tarry with this negative, if you want to be open to this dimension of the unknown, um, it's in the other and in the neighbor and even more in the enemy and that somehow remaining open to that. Um, and the, the interesting thing for me is also what using Todd McGowan, one of the things um. I, you know, one of my interests in Christianity is that if you have uh, a notion that at one stage, say, feudal society where everyone's castrated, everyone's kind of, there's a certain price we all had to pay to exist, but there's an exception, which is God, for example, or the Lord, but say God is the exception. And then in modern society, we have this idea that no one needs to be castrated. Achievement society, you know, self-optimization, you can, you can, be whole and complete, then the message of we're all castrated, including God, <laughs> we're, we're that the, that all of us, there's something about lack and the void that marks us, but not, but there's no exceptions to that. And actually, you know, that it's, it's elephants all the way down, it's void all the way down. And as yeah. we, yeah, right. you know, and as we identify with that, we kind of find freedom from the tyranny of happiness, the tyranny of enjoyment, the tyranny of of always attempting to find a, a you know a way to fulfill that. And um, I'm interested in you know actually you help me square the circle of like 
religion as a way of of in, engaging with the mystery, the unknown, and the other, and also religion potentially as a way. And this is this is what I think is that you have a weekly space <laughs> where you realize that. Uh, that this contradiction and this void and this unknowing is is woven into everything and can never be overcome and that that actually has a political dimension that has a dimension that can free us from a libidinal investment in wanting the latest iphone the latest this the latest that it it has yeah. a it has a salvatory or a curative dimension yeah and you're absolutely right that todd um todd mcgowan's work is very centered on that uh, whole appreciation for that, yeah, what, what Hegel called tarrying with the negative and, and very much invested in, in, in critiquing that contemporary culture that- Which is where I thought you would us do. One after That's another um, toy to distract ourselves from what we're actually really most profoundly about. But the twist, the twist of you, because that's where I thought you were going to go. And then the twist with you and the book, Embracing the Void, was um, this really interpersonal, this, this real actual focus, not on Christ crucified, not on kind of the, the self-divided absolute, but on Jesus, the one who says, love your enemy, um, which yeah. I loved because <laughs> sometimes I had no place for Jesus in my theology i had a real place for you know the shizeki and christ on the cross my god my god why have you ever seen the self-divided god and i never really knew in recent years what to do with jesus um and your focus was very much on that yeah well i i i uh, i got a new appreciation of christianity through this book I, I should also <laughs> warn readers, uh, user warning, uh, whatever, uh, that my conclusion is 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 that Christianity, if if religious, if the religious impulse is the is the human symptom par excellence, that is to say, it's it's that to which we are drawn, and that against which we most have to defend ourselves. That's if, if that's what symptomatic means, then Christianity is religion is always symptomatic in this sense we're drawn to this void but we also have to kind of defend ourselves from it with rules and regulations and, and various pieties and so on and so forth but christianity is the most symptomatic in the sense that christianity is the religion that actually among all the other world religions, the most directly and simply and insistently brings us back to the original source of our experience of dusting. It's the fellow human being. It's not, and it's not this special human being who brings us this gospel. Jesus would, would say, wait a second, don't put me on a pedestal here. My whole, my whole message is, whatever I am, is in every person you meet. I'm not something special, except that I'm trying to tell you about the infinite specialness in every human being and in you. That's the point. But even as I find this uh, kind of, I must say, in a certain sense, refound Christianity in a really radical alternative view of it, um, at the same time, and some people may find this tough, I end up saying Christianity got it actually better than any, any religion in a certain sense, but it also, I think, betrays its own vision more than any other religion. So it's the most symptomatic, it's, it's, it's the most radical success, but precisely because it comes too close to the source of the anxiety, we need more elaborate defenses against it. I mean, at what Jesus tells us to do is to, as you say, not just love your neighbor, not just love your neighbor. Torah said that already. Well, you need to love your enemy yeah. as yourself. This is a, a virtually impossible directive. And therefore, it becomes almost inevitable that a 
a symptomatic backlash, a kind of defensive backlash has got to, to, to play in. If only, be, you know, to, to, to spare me that the, the kind of dizzying infinite challenge of this Christian message, Christian directive. Yeah. And this is, um, and this brings us, I, I, how would you, like, uh, out of all of the ways of describing, like, post-theistic or A-stroke theistic or beyond, like, because this gets us kind of into a very different discourse than traditional does God exist or not exist. This brings us into you yes. saying that kind of like it's an encounter with this radical unknown that that defies the theist atheist divide. Yes, that's right. It does. It does, and 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 maybe makes everybody unhappy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, um, I don't talk about it very much in the book. Um, maybe I'll try to develop it in some other text sometime when I can dig into it, but um, but but it's very much connected with the notion of kenosis, mm -hmm. the Greek word for self-emptying. Um, Meister Eckhart, among other of the mystics, really emphasizes this kenotic idea that, that God is essentially kenotic. That is to me, that is to say, God self-empties out of love, he creates the open space in which something other can come into being. In this sense, God is the ultimate unknown, the ultimate abyss, the ultimate void, the self-creating void that enables other things to be, that opens the space for the rest of existence. Uh, for existence altogether. I'm it's gonna, a very cool. I mean, it's a very cool. Yeah. It's very much like your um, pyro theology, which wants to, you know, burn the church, maybe, <laughs> but really take the lesson. Yeah. Well, the, the question. Lesson, yeah. Of, the of question for next week, because I, because this is very much. I mean, everything you say is very in line with what we're trying to do, and. The question for next week, not this week, but is, is it possible to have an institution uh, based on these ideas? And um, I'm excited because that's what a question that really interests me. Is it possible to have a church of uh, um, this of this radical contradiction, this radical encounter with the unknown, or is that impossible? Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn to some questions on the uh on this, see if there's any questions. And as I'm saying that, to to sum up what uh, like you're saying, I think in the first section of the book, then is the infant uh, encounters, yeah, not just the presence and absence of the mother, but then the present absence of this desire that both draws us in and can terrify us. Yeah. But that 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 marks us as a subject this this unknown dimension of the other and it it remains within us and and part of us was that a good kind of that's a very very brief in one sentence but is that a you know that's one of the kind of uh building blocks of of the text yes absolutely um i would i would add to that that the first half what i call part one um kind of like the tool the tool tool chest part of the book where we sort of get these basic concepts ready to apply to religious life and religious traditions. One of the things I spend a lot of time clarifying there, which I hope doesn't kind of overdo people, but it, 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 it is the question of language um, and, and, and symbolic, symbolization. And basically what I wanna say there can be encapsulated. I, I go on maybe at too much length, I don't know, but the, the basic point is quite simple, that every entry into language participates in this relationship to the open unknown. That means whenever I use a word, if I use the word home, let's say, I'm here in my home, I'm speaking to you from my home, uh, true. I'm on the third floor of my house, my home and I have a little study getaway. What does the word home mean? Well, it doesn't take long to realize that home 
maybe the image we have of the little house and the little chimney and the nice pleasant smoke coming out the chimney and the flowers and the bed around it, that might be a kind of an image of home, but it's not the essence of home. The essence of home might not look anything like that. It might be an, an, an experience of, of a family reuniting in the midst of the, of the war in Ukraine where they spend the night in a, in a, in a shelter somewhere and they have a profound experience of regaining home, even in the midst of absolutely losing home. So home is, a, home is like everything we have. Everything in human life is haunted by a kind of question mark. Uh, and I, want, I go to some length to show how language, human language, as Lacan thinks of it, is always reposing, whether we are aware of it and willing to pay attention to it or not, it reposes this enigma this kind of void of unknowing. Yeah. Every word does. I mean, if we're yeah. alert to pick it up. Yeah, like I was thinking today about like there's different there's always we always feel the frustration between what is said and what is meant. And we always feel that we want to bridge that divide. But if we ever bridge that divide, it would actually we wouldn't have an angelic language. We'd have communication. Like animals can say exactly what you know, whenever they make a certain sound, it means mating or threat, yeah. that there's something about language that always has a dimension of where you miscommunicate in the communication. You cannot say what you mean. And in fact, what you mean is kind of generated by the failure itself. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wish actually, now that we're talking about this, I wish I'd put this in the book more clearly. The proper name is the ultimate moment of language where we both say and don't say what we're talking about. So if we wanna know, what does Peter Rollins mean? Here's a word unlike home or box or tea kettle or tree that seems to have an obvious signified, an obvious referent. Peter Rollins, well, he's the guy I'm talking to right now. But who and what really is Peter Rollins? Who, of course, the question can be, who or what am I? Yeah. Who is this Rick Boothby character? I hopefully, before I kick the bucket, adequately confront that question and sort of say, yeah, who, who am I? Who, who can I be? Who should I be? Who mm -hmm. might I be? Uh, so this relationship of language to both naming something and pointing to it, you know, indicating it, but also evoking something about what I'm referring to with this radical question mark, that is even heightened. It's, in, it's present in all language, potentially anyway. But the proper name, you could say, this is the reason why we don't call ourselves by common nouns, but we reserve this special appellation of what we call the proper name because it's not a thing it's a question mark what does it mean to become peter ron well i have been very greedy here so i'm going to go to questions i apologize everyone who's watching and asking questions and i've been just stealing all of the questions but uh very i'll jump in with a few uh so kate talks about and you use this example actually i heard you use the example uh, in an interview recently but um where Kate says, so the inverted commas, meaningless social conversation about the weather or how are you fine, thanks, is, is that a type of protective mechanism? Um, you know, that's so, yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a most common protective mechanism are precisely these kind of banal greetings that, that, that interestingly were, were expected to know that when I say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How are you? Hey, how are you? That's not a real question. You're supposed to kind of know that. <laughs> Part of being a civilized person is you know that's not a real question. So you don't really answer it. You just say fine. And the fine is not a real answer. But yeah, so Kate's exactly right. That's, that's really crucial. Um, by the way, though, uh, even while we're kind of doing this kind of empty speech, as Lacan calls it at one point, um, just to keep on the surface, not to, not to allow ourselves to go into anything really substantive and mysterious about one another. 
the very fact that we all kind of know this, we all know this is a game. It's what Lacan calls the falsely false. It's false and we know it's false and we kind of don't mention it to each other, but we all agree that it's, of course, that's just routine. It's fake in a certain sense. But that also provides the point of jumping off where we might say, hi, how are you? And you say, fine. And then I say, yeah, but I heard that you had a death in the family. And so actually I'm really asking you, how are you really doing? Yeah. yeah. So, so it, it, this too becomes the empty speech of the banal exchange also can become a kind of opening if we're willing to uh, allow it. Yes, I love that you, you mentioned that in the podcast and it's true, I've had that conversation where you go, how are you fine? And then there's a moment either when they say, well, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not. Or you say, as you said, Lair, or listen, I, I, heard, I heard your mother died and I know you're not okay. And those, those moments then create this incredible opportunity for a connection. Yeah, yeah this is the thing that I tried to... Um... Um, describe in, in the, the memoir you mentioned, Blown Away, about my son's death. Um, and I, I should say, uh, I was very grateful to finally be able to write that book and, and get it published. Um, a couple people have been critical of it, actually. Um, the only review I even know of it, <laughs> one paragraph review, is actually quite critical of it. It says it's self-indulgent and and baffling. It's, I think they say it's disorienting or something like that. But I was trying to open up exactly this question of how, when we lose something, particularly when we lose a loved one, that opens up a space that, that we really need to take seriously to not bury it literally too quickly, but to really abide with it and, and experience it be open to that open but that's not easy um be open to that unknown you know of saying yes who was you couldn't guy? do it forever that's the other thing like you couldn't like if 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 you i mean that's an open wound that lasts from that but if 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 everybody always answered truthfully to the question how are you well society wouldn't be able to to run so there's exactly yeah, yeah right exactly Oh, yeah, I'll jump in with a few more. Um, I'm going to come back to yours, John, because yours is a good technical question. John's doing a PhD. Well, I'll do it and see if you want to go for this. He says, John says, am I wrong in understanding that the dimension of the other is not only anxiety producing because it's unknown, but on a deeper level because desire is the metonomic shifting, which is impossible? Does that can make yes. sense? With yeah. I, I, well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, I would agree totally what, what opens up for us there, if we are open to it, is, uh, yes, metonymy might be one way of talking about it, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of invitation, one might say, to, to being exposed to what is unknown in oneself, um, and that you could say, you know, the best love relation is precisely, I think, a kind of exchange of opportunity between two people to learn from each other, to be open to each other in ways that re-expose us, both of us in love, to, um, to what is unknown in each other and, and in ourselves. And would you say then a fixation is when desire stops shifting? It kind of locks onto something or? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, and, then, and we're 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 all quite liable to fixation. We're we're quite invested in it, and yeah, the the the, the most obvious indicator for uh, any couples therapist that there's really a problem at home is when the couple come in for an, a, an interview and 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 he says something and she says, "Oh, that's what you always say. You're so predictable. I'm so sick of hearing that." In other words, here's a couple for whom the questions are all excruciatingly obvious, the answer to all of them. In fact, what's terrible is that there's nothing unknown here at all. There's no opening, there's no listening. 
because you think you've heard it all yeah. and you're disgusted by what you've ceaselessly heard from the other. So that's when you know the love relation's really over in a certain sense is when the unknown in one another has kind of been shut off. Okay, I'm going to keep quick fire into you. Somebody mentioned uh, this because we've talked a lot about the scapegoat mechanism in other seminars, but um, do you, where does the scapegoat mechanism fit, if at all, in what you're describing with this encounter with the other's desire? Well, a scapegoat, of course, is, is, is the structure of the scapegoat syndrome is you take something that is threatening and you, you try to locate it outside yourself and sort of fix it over there. So you're going to, if somebody is going to have to get torn to pieces, you sure don't want it to be you. So you elect the scapegoat to stand in for the terrible thing that might happen to you or somebody you care about. So the scapegoat is to sort of localize the hurt. Um, by the way, it also, along the way, defines the hurt. And I think what I'm trying to talk about with the concept of dusting as a key to our relationship with others and with ourself. Part of what that means is you can't farm it out to a scapegoat. You have to be the one. But also, you don't know what has to happen to the scapegoat. Um, you need to be open to that too. So scapegoating is, you might say, doubly a kind of fakery. It, 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 it directs toward a particular scapegoat other this unpleasant, threatening treatment. But it also defines what that treatment is. And authentically, we should be open that, to that ourselves to bring it upon ourselves, but also open it to the idea that we're not gonna know what's coming and we shouldn't, we can't. We have to be open to it, to learning it as we go. Is there any connection then between scapegoating and the phobic object? Is that was similar to what someone does with a phobia or? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. A phobia, I think does it even more because it uh, classically turns what might otherwise be the anxiety in the face of the open and the unknown, that still is, the, I think, a rough but correct definition of anxiety. It, it has no object. But the phobia both locates it, you know, as long as we can keep those spiders away, we're, we're safe. But it also defines what is terrifying rather than leaving it even more disturbingly an open question. So phobia is kind of a double uh, double scapegoat mechanism. Very good. John here, um, I think he just actually sums up what you're saying very well to see if you agree, but he says, contrary to Freud then, Lacan would not try to overcome the symptom of religion with the hope of an enlightenment rationality beyond symptom, but as an inescapable relation to dusting the unknown. The, the only objection I would have to that, John, is I, I don't think it's fair to say, this, being really honest, I don't think Lacan himself says that. Um, I think Lacan was incredibly um, anxious <laughs> about being perceived as being too open to the religious. Um, and I think, I don't know exactly what was behind that, but I... I try to say at the opening of the book, I'm filling in a blank here that Lacan himself expressly refused to fill in. Cool. And the only reason why I feel safe doing that is I'm filling it in with the impossibility of filling it in. Yeah. That's the only thing that makes me feel like maybe Lacan would, wouldn't totally reject this. But it is important to remember he, he thought it was a hot potato. He would not touch this. I kind of want to always wonder whether, and you know, she's like, I don't, but he briefly, you know, he wrote three books in theology and he was very in that world for a tiny bit. And then I think kind yeah. of like walk, walked away from it. And I kind of almost wonder if it's the same kind of thing that he was like, I don't want to be misunderstood as some sort of 
defending an institution or theism or so absolutely you know. right and i uh this i think connects with your earlier question peter which is a huge really challenging and a question which i don't have an answer to is it possible to imagine and to enact some kind of a what we could call a religious practice a religious sensibility, a religious community uh, that that minimizes the symptomatic defense and maximizes the enriching influence of exposure to something of the unknown in ourselves and others, loving the neighbor and loving the enemy in them and in myself. Is that possible? What does that tradition even look like? Um, I, I I pose it really, really briefly at the end, super briefly, like, you know, a couple of sentences. It, it, that strikes me as the, the challenge for the future. And I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I can't wait to jump into that next because that's my, that's, that, that fascinates me. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. And this yeah. is why I've been so grateful about the connection that you made your your audience may know this already but peter very graciously invited me to come to belfast and, and give a couple of talks um on these very um topics and um and it's been super uh i'm very grateful to have met you and and learned about your own concerns with exactly these questions um it's why i feel like however different our modes of approach are we're very much moving in the same um region of of questions and um, aspirations. Yeah. So very quickly, I'll do. Can I just do? I'll do like the last three or four questions very quickly. I'm aware that the time's been more, but it was. I had 15 minutes at the beginning where I messed up. Um, but very quickly, I will jump into Alfie. What is Alfie Bowen who uh, is watching? Who says, "What is the relationship between interpretation and desire?" What does it do to our desire when we understand it psychoanalytically? Psychoanalytically, I think uh, Nicholas Abraham called the process uh, anasemia. Is that anasemia? Uh, do you know? Do you know that term? I'm probably saying it wrong. Anasemia. I, I don't know the term, but um, uh, I I would. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to do justice to the question, but to the, my immediate response, if I understand what the questioner is really after here, is that the relationship of interpretation, the kind of thing that most people want to sort of understand as the outcome of a good analysis, you've kind of come to interpret your symptoms, you've come to kind of work through your, your, your shtick, you know, your, your, your neurotic inheritance and so on. I would venture that almost all of what a good psychoanalyst, and maybe the word good in front of it is important here, not any and every psychoanalyst, but everybody with a shingle out there as a practicing analyst, but I would say a good psychoanalyst, a good psychoanalysis as a process, doesn't necessarily end with interpretation in, in, in the sense that you may interpret your neurotic dead ends and your misidentifications and your overcompensations and your fetishes and your self-assurances and so on so that you can get to a moment of appropriating even even getting some vague sense of your true desires that don't require and in a certain sense won't afford won't allow an interpretation you mm. don't know why yeah. it has to be this way you don't know why you have to do this uh but you do yeah you come to enjoy how you enjoy in many ways you come to yeah, accept yeah. or counter sign your enjoyment in some ways yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean i often think of it like that like a type of um well the example i've used recently but it was a friend of mine who was always in trouble with his wife and he was getting really annoyed about it because she was always thought he was in the wrong and my friend was a bit of an asshole so he often was in the wrong but not always <laughs> and um he was getting sick of this but then as we talked kind of realized that you know he loves wooing 
in his work, he loves overcoming and also in relationships. And his wife also likes to be wooed. And actually what was happening in a dysfunctional way was she was often maybe getting him in trouble to put him as a, in a position where he would be able to win her over. And she enjoyed that, but so did he. And the, the answer for him, whenever he kind of realized, oh yeah, I kind of, is was not to change the form of desire, but to kind of like, in a sense, accept, oh, that's how she desires and I desire. And it actually can work quite well. And so immediately realized that, okay, when she tells me off next time, I can kind of read it as an enjoyable process of winning a roofer again. Um, so yeah, yeah, so it felt like there was an alienation from the enjoyment. But the enjoyment was still happening. They just weren't enjoying their enjoyment, but it was kind of still there at work. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to make a risky, to make a, a site of a somewhat risky quote, I, I what popped into my mind a minute ago is that the end of analysis, of a good analysis, might be the, the point where you've, you've gotten a little distance from your own self-inflicted slavery to some neurotic repetitions and you kind of see it now and you go you know what i've had it with that you know now i see it for what it is i don't want to be that anymore but you don't necessarily know where you do want to be um except maybe certain things that kind of feel like they're new directives maybe just birthing and you might and, and you might simply have to say well kind of the way Martin Luther says, again, this is the dangerous reference. I'm not a big Martin Luther fan necessarily, but the idea when Luther says, here I stand, I can do no other. There's something I think about the end of analysis that's inviting that sort of Lutherian moment where you're done with all neurotic stuff that you've learned about in your analysis and what's motivating you now you can't maybe define for somebody else and maybe not even to yourself why you're after this but this is the thing for me now yeah um, i think freud would actually approve of that and lacan would certainly approve of it of your out beyond your capacity to justify it or even maybe define it you're just in it Wonderful. Well, thank you. We'll finish there. Um, for anybody, you know, next week, we're going to have another conversation. So bring your questions. I got to most of them, but not all of them. Uh, Richard, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, you're still up for next week. That was I'm a good enough much, experience. Yeah, very <laughs> Fantastic. Enough you bet. Wonderful. Take care. Bye-bye. You too, Peter. Thank you very much.